you, Sarah. Um, so welcome everyone to another Wednesday evening with the Clear Mountain Monastery community. And actually this week we are pre-recording this because Ajahn Nisibo and I will be actually teaching a retreat in Bellingham. Uh, but we're doing this a week ahead of time and I'm so fortunate to have a uh, good friend Kitty Saro um, here today. And uh, what this will mean for everyone tuning in live is that uh, you just won't be able to ask live questions because we're not actually live, but we will still have our Zoom meeting after this at uh, 6.45, so please do go over there. Um, but without further ado, uh, let me read a quick biography. So this is Venerable, or this is Kitty Saro. So Kitty Saro, Harry Randolph Weinberg, is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, after graduating from Princeton as a Rhodes Scholar and continuing his studies at Oxford, Kitty Saro traveled to Thailand to ordain with Ajahn Chah in 1976. He was a monk for 15 years, and during that time helped found Chithurst Monastery and Devon Vihara in the UK. He trained monks, was a prison chaplain, and taught extensively. He disrobed in 1991, and since then has taught internationally. In 2000, he and his wife Tanisra co-founded Dhammagiri Sacred Mountain Retreat in South Africa and helped initiate and support a number of HIV and AIDS response projects. He has studied and practiced Chan in Pure Land for 35 years, informed by the Chinese School of Master Hua, and has completed two year-long silent self-retreats. With Tanisra, he is co-author of Listen to the Heart, a contemplative journey to engage Buddhism. Kitisaro is a member of the Spirit Rock Teacher Council and is co-founder of the religious public charity organization, Sacred Mountain Sangha which celebrates the mutually supportive qualities of the Theravada and Mahayana traditions. Kitisaro is also finishing up a master's degree in Buddhist classics at Dharma Realm Buddhist University, which is where we are now. So, Kitisaro, thank you for, for joining us. Um, I thought, I mean, you have a long, you've had a long Buddhist life, and there are many things that uh, I think people listening and myself would love to hear about, but I thought maybe just to focus this session, hoping that we'll have sessions in the future, uh, this session around your memories and your experience with Ajahn Chah, because I know a lot of people are uh, never met him, and you uh, not only met him, but, but trained with him. So, yeah, that'll be the overarching theme. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to, to be here and to speak with you, Ajahn, and uh, particularly um, graceful to be able to remember Lumpa Cha, Ajahn Cha. Lumpa means in <clears throat> Thai Venerable Father, and it has this grandfatherly, loving, blessed quality, and that's uh, how I remember Ajahn Cha. I met him 47 years ago mm. and um, yeah, I remember such, such uh, compassion, compassion is the, uh, one of the first qualities that come to mind. I, just hearing about him made me want to go to Thailand. I met, I was doing my studies at Oxford, was going to, Ajahn mentioned here that I had this Rhodes Scholarship and I was going to just do something different, uh, writing a thesis in art, science and mysticism in the works of Aldous Huxley as a sort of broadening my education, then I was going to go back to medical school. So... Um, I had done my first meditation retreat at Oxford, outside of Oxford, in 1976. And at the end of the retreat, the manager of this little retreat center outside of Oxford said, oh, there's a visiting uh, scientist, professor type person from Thailand that needs a place to stay. And I said, oh, he can stay in my flat. 
And, um, and so after the retreat, he, he spent a few days and he had all sorts of stories of walking across, trekking across the North Pole and dining with the king and queen of Thailand. He was very confident. This Dr. Burns? Dr. Burns, okay. Dr. Douglas Burns. Okay. And he, had, um, he was doing, one of his hobbies was doing, because he was a psychiatrist, doing personality tests on monks in all different monasteries around Thailand and seeing the long-term effects on their personalities of meditation. So he was just talking and I'm listening, but then he said there's a, you know, there's a very special monastery and his, he was very confident. <laughs> and some could even say he came across as so confident that he might even be seemed like he's arrogant, but he was confident. But when he talked about the special monastery and he said there's one special teacher <laughs> and his whole demeanor shifted when he mentioned Ajahn Chah, he said he's enlightened. But what struck me was not so much the word enlightened, but this confident, very athletic, confident, brilliant, no-nonsense scientist. When he mentioned Ajahn Chah, his body assumed this, this um, demeanor of reverence, and there, the whole air was charged with reverence, and that was just such a delicious, unusual feeling for me. And then he went on to say, and he has a few Westerners away, and his senior Western disciple, Ajahn Sumedho, if he's not enlightened, he's close. <laughs> and, uh, but I just wanted to meet this Ajahn Chah, and when I heard that he had a few Westerners. So he offered, I'll take you. So I got a leave of absence from the university, and much to the horror of my parents, set off, this was 1976, set off to Thailand, with the hopes of meeting this, this. Uh... So when I first met Ajahn Chah, I was, you know, I had read the, I don't know if you ever read uh, Be Here Now by Ram Dass. Mm -hmm. And when he met Maharaji, Maharaji, you know, tapped him mm -hmm. and he burst into tears and, and, you know, kind of like, I've been waiting for you. And, and um, you know, so I was, you know, hoping for something uh, special. But, uh, and I won't even go, I almost didn't make it because I arrived on the worst day in modern Thai history. They had a revolution on mm -hmm. the day I arrived. Okay. And there was a massacre of students at Tamashat University. Usually Thai revolutions don't, no shots fired. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Dr. Burns said, no, no, just be, be calm. Let's let everything calm down. So we waited a week and then he was able to take me on the train up to the Northeast. And then we got the little motorized vehicle out to Wat Pa Pong. And uh, we're walking in. And uh, the monks were walking on alms round as we were walking in. And it was, uh, the, my first impression of the shaved head was, was quite shocking. Mm -hmm. I, it was something was very real about it but the skulls it was like a line of skulls coming out <laughs> I was a bit, a bit taken aback and you hadn't met monks before no, in England no. but... I'd, I'd met a, I had met a monk okay. that uh, and heard them chant uh, but somehow this in the barefoot walking out of the forest a line of them in the early morning sun somehow it really struck me and it was a, it was a little sobering was something sobering. Um, so I finally got to meet Ajahn Chah. He was sitting under his hut. His hut was on stilts and uh, there's a little marble floor underneath it and he had a wicker chair he was sitting in and a few lay people around him and a few monks and, and Dr. Burns took me and I saw him bow so I did the best I could to follow along as a gesture of respect. And uh, Ajahn Chah said, uh, Doug said a few words in Thai, and uh, I, um, Doug introduced me to Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah said, well, why did you come? And I mumbled something about 
the enlightenment or didn't know what I was talking about or balance or you know how sometimes when you talk you're speaking but you, you don't really know what you're talking about but I was saying something um, but I wasn't very confident but then when he said um, have you ever meditated before I felt quite more confident because I'd done a 10 day retreat. I mean, <laughs> we're talking some serious experience, Yeah, okay. 10 days, I mean, this yeah. is not any old 10 days. We got so it four in the morning. And, and so, uh, you know, and I didn't say this, but I thought he would notice in this particular Ubakin Goenka style, you, you do Anapanasati for three years, uh, days, mindfulness of the breath, and then you scan the body very slowly. And I didn't tell Ajahn Chah this, but I thought that I had a, had potential for meditation because I could scan down both sides simultaneously, which I thought might have been a talent or something like that. But I, you know, anyway, so I'm uh, telling Ajahn Chah about the meditation I'm doing. And right in the middle of my explanation, he gets off the wicker chair and he gets down on the floor on all fours. <laughs> like a dog and is going around sniffing all parts of his body under his arms, his leg, <laughs> saying some things and people are, are laughing. <laughs> and even I was smiling because how can you not? But uh, it was, uh, you don't have to be Piscean, sensitive Piscean mm -hmm. to tell he wasn't particularly impressed with my meditation. <laughs> and... Um, so finally, I'm sort of saying, Doug, what's he saying? And finally, Ajahn Chai gets back on his chair with this big grin. And uh, and he, he, Doug said something about it. He, you don't need to look all over the place. Something like that. He said... Why don't you be with your breathing? If you understand one thing well, you'll understand everything. If you try to understand everything, you might end up understanding nothing thoroughly. And uh, and so in a sense, even though, you know, on one level you could say, oh, he made fun of me, but it wasn't... Uh, like you're the dog. It's searching I around. I the dog for, sniffing you've come all the way from England all, and all Tennessee. All over the place. Yeah. And I've been writing this the <laughs> thesis on art science and mysticism and yeah. works of all this other thing. <laughs> and that teaching about, why don't you be with your breathing? Mm. And then he said, let Samato teach you how to be a monk. But if you understand one thing well, you understand everything. This, this one, it, it was funny. But two, it's sometimes what he calls stabbing the heart. He, he got my attention. He noticed me. He... He affected me. But that teaching about sometimes we're trying so much to figure things out, dealing with all sorts of complexity, but that teaching of learning how to return to the simp utter simplicity of being with an in-breath and an out-breath, seeing that every in-breath begins and ends. The in-breath turns into the out-breath. And, and, and with that coming, allowing oneself to come to the beautiful simplicity of the moment, reestablishing oneself as one abiding with the way things are, has a, a, as a platform, as a refuge, as a, as a, a dwelling from which mm -hmm. to, to, as a place of knowing, mm -hmm. The Puru. So, you know, he, so that was my first, you know, he definitely got my attention. And I didn't, for some reason, I trusted him. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't doubt him. I, I wanted to become a monk. You did want it. Was that spontaneous at that moment? Or had you I just wanted to, I, I thought I would go for a year or two, get, get in, get enlightened. You know, I didn't know what that meant, but I thought... I thought I could do it in a year, but then I thought, come on, you're being a bit arrogant. Give yourself two years. So right, yeah. I'd gotten a leave. <laughs> Road scholar. I mean, years, that is yeah. so ridiculous. Yeah. But anyway, so, uh, you know, uh, by that time, they were just, it was early days of the Wat Na Na Chat, the International Monastery. And so, uh, Ajahn Sumedho 
So I was at first just a postulant. And um, and then, but then, of course, my parents were, were, this is in the days of the cults. This is in the days where, right. if you look on the globe, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Thailand are as far, f almost the other side of the globe. It wasn't many years. It was also in the 70s, I believe, where that Jonestown, Jonestown massacre right, right. had. 70, 70, 70. Yeah, there was also the, the uh, you know, the the rumors of the um, killing fields in Cambodia. See, because the Northeast was near the Laotian border, it was near the Cambodian border. My parents were, re they didn't know whether I was in a cult, so they kind of flew out from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And my mom is not the kind of person that wants to go to a Thai jungle, a Thai forest. But I guess the next, thing I definitely in remembering Ajahn Shah I his compassion mm. that he took time to spend time with my family mm. because he knew they were they were worried he had time for them was this the same occurrence did they come once or did they come multiple times they came once they came well, well they came to monasteries in England but they came to Thailand once okay. and um, and in Thailand, for the most part, when you ordain, it's a celebration because it's respected. But some of the... Ajahn Chah was aware that for many of the Western parents, it was like, a, you know, it's so foreign, it's like losing a child. They had no sense of what was going on. And Ajahn Chah did something that was so thoughtful. He... Um, he decided on the spur of the moment, it wasn't planned, but when my parents were there, he decided, because I was in white as a Nanakarika with, under the eight precepts, he decided to ordain me as a novice. Wow. With, while, parents, with my then. parents so that wow. they could be part of the ceremony and be a part of it. And so there were three other novices, Westerns, that, that were going to ordain with me. So there were going to be four of us that he decided, let's do it with them there. So... So my parents went into Warren, the local village, bought food, uh, offered a meal to Ajahn Chai and the Sangha. They, they participated in the ceremony of offering the bowl and robes. And, they, and though they still weren't happy that I was... Uh, um, they couldn't really understand it. They knew because of they had a long conversation with Ajahn and Chah that I'll tell you about. They knew that this was a real somehow they they sensed the authenticity mm. of the project, of what was going on. And to me, that's that's Ajahn Chah's compassion. Mm. You know, he he my dad was saying, it's dang, isn't it dangerous here? He said, you know, what about the communist guerrillas? You know, there was that, that going on in parts of Thailand and also there was, you know, the rumors, as I mentioned, the whole horrors of the aftermath of Vietnam and that w catastrophic war that America was part of and, and the rumors about, I guess, killing fields in Cambodia, and then these communist guerrillas, and so they, and my dad asked them, and Ajahn Chah said, yeah, you know, there's dangers, mm. he said, but there's more danger, <laughs> he pointed, he said, there's more dangers from the guerrillas <laughs> in the heart. The guerrillas in the heart, wow. The guerrillas in the heart, and he gave a beautiful talk about the how the not knowing the these greed, hatred, delusions, these these moods, not knowing those that they will rob us, rob us of well being. He just gave this beautiful talk about what we're doing. You know, that we're in, in these monasteries, we're we're we're, 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 we're looking at what attacks us and, and gives rise to confusion and distress and, and harm and robs us of well-being. So my parents got to hear a Dhamma talk from Rupa Cha and he, and they, uh, 
Dad never could quite say his name right. The Argon Cha, <laughs> but uh, but they they were touched by. Him. Wow, so that was like maybe a two week visit, or I can't remember how long they stayed. They flew to the little airport in Warren. I guess they must have stayed probably a week or so. But then they turned it in their trip to the Orient. You know, they turned uh, it into, and they brought me some. You know, later when I disrobed, they had brought back from that trip some Buddhists from Thailand, and then they, I think they even went on to, they might have gone to Japan too. Mm. But, um... Well, it turned out that it was somewhat of a, a dangerous place. I mean, you ended up getting somewhat sick. How long was it, you know, after you ordained? I, I um... No, I got sick pretty soon. Yeah. I was, uh... Again, I was, I brought, you know, I used to be a competitive wrestler, and so I brought this, you bring, you bring your, your, okay, I had the wonderful monastic discipline, so you're leaving behind, leaving behind intoxicants, and you know, you're following the celibate renunciate path, but one still brings one's tendencies, and so, you know, I was very competitive and very pushing, pushing myself, which are all, they're not bad qualities. But I, at some point, after I'd been there a while, so I finally became a monk in July the 21st, 1977. And then I thought, there's too much talking here at the Western. You know, we chat too much. I want to go off. And I'd heard that Ajahn Chah had a, the real uh, toughest, his fiercest disciple that really pushed you was uh, this uh, this charismatic monk known as Ajahn John. Mm. I don't know if you ever... I definitely heard of him. Ajahn Lumpur Pasna talks about him yeah, extremely yeah, highly. Yeah, he was covered with tattoos. He used to be an extemporaneous uh, poet, singer. Yeah, Molan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, gold teeth covered with tattoos. But then he... Gold he, teeth? I didn't realize yeah, that. <laughs> but then he had been turned around by Ajahn Chah and he, he had this... I'm not saying it right, probably had this monastery, the Bung Kao Lung, you know, the swamp, <laughs> swamp mountain something, mm. I don't know, monastery, and but it has a, an old forest in it. And it was uh, there that I started, you know, I ended up having, you know, the severe diarrhea for months and months. And then I got bitten by a centipede there, which is the most painful sting in the forest. And I was quite sensitive to mosquitoes even. You know, I get a mosquito bite, not really. It really puffs up. And so I had this most painful sting. So uh, in the, ironically, in the dying shed, we, as you know, we... Robe dying. Robe yeah. dying. We yeah. chop up with the jackfruit wood, this fragrant bark, and boil it, and then wash the dye and wash the rose so that they're cl cleaned and made fragrant again and and uh, in the dying shed uh, the special part of the monastery where you do that and then we had these little grass thin grass mats where we were sitting while this process would happen and then at the end I was rolling up the mat and obviously one of these centipedes and this one was probably you know five to six inches long and about I don't know three quarters of an inch wide not the biggest one but that that is but and, and it, I suddenly felt this piercing thing, and I lifted my hand up, and the, the two pinchers were on my ring finger. It was just hanging down, and the Thai monk that was with me yelled out, Duck up! The, the uh, centipede. Uh, centipede! And he slung it off my hand, and then he squeezed it really hard to try to get little drops of blood and the poison out. Then the word went out, the farong is the farmer's been bitten by the centipede in this fire, this this really intense pain. And I'm thinking, God, uh, if I'm allergic to mosquitoes, what's gonna happen? And, and it was so painful I could just kind of rock and moan. But then I did, they got Ajahn John in and then the, they had all these they steamed my hand and then they did mantras and spit on it and they did all other kind of things. And I had to sit in the meditation hall all night just moaning. I couldn't sit still as it kept climbing and I was wondering what's going to happen. You know, it, did, it didn't kill me. But I, um, 
I, I rocked, and then my hand stayed. This is what ended up sending me to the hospital. My hand swelled up for three weeks. But not long after, you know, so in the early days aftermath of it, before I went to the hospital, Ajahn Chah came to visit. Mm. To that monastery. To you that were staying monastery. With and the monks all said, oh, the frung has been bit. And Ajahn Chah mm. came up and he just said, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said something like, let's see. And he mm. held my hand. Mm. Jet my, you know, uh-huh. did it hurt? And uh, again, it's the compassion, just the, you know, the compassion. Because when you're in his attention, just everything melts, melts away. And he knew I was the only Westerner there, and he had brought us, someone who could speak English with him. So after he held my hand, he, he said, no, why don't you go talk some of your hmm. <laughs> language with this person? Uh, so that was a sweet, but then it um, wasn't long after that, a week or so, I started urinating blood. Then the fierce Ajahn, you know, just thought, gee, he's sick. Mm. So they sent me to the hospital back in, in Warren, which is a just a rural hospital, uh, back in Ubon. It's a rural hospital, and it was... Uh, Terrifying. I was in incredible pain, urinating blood. And the, the boy across the aisle, there was a monk's ward, had a massive wound in his leg, and they were worried that he was going to lose the leg, and his little brother was sleeping under the bed. The guy on my right died of some kind of dysentery, the left was going to have a kidney operation. I didn't want pain medicine because I didn't think I needed it, and I was uh, woke up in the middle of the night with a scream, and it was my own scream. And and what was calming was on the loudspeaker, there was a novice, a recording of a novice chanting, it to be so pagawa alam you know, the chant. But I, it was, it was scary, and I was just wanting to get out of there. And Ajahn Chah came to visit. Mm. The um, hospital. I was the only monkey knew. But when he came to the door of the ward, it was like a, you know, when the, the early morning sun, that incredible ball of orange. That's, that's a kind of. Welcome, dawning, hopeful sign. He went around and touched and spoke to every single one. Mm-hmm. And and then he got to me and he had a a nun that could translate, Western nun that could translate, because my tie still wasn't very good. And he said, uh, well, what's up? How's it going? And I said, I want to get out of here. And he said, I'll send the police after you. <laughs> and he tried to leave, so he got me to laugh. He got me to laugh, and I and I said, well, what do you do about all this pain? And it was something like, don't we concept on none. It's important just to know pain as pain. Something like that, and uh, and he said, "Pom chai chai chai." Forgive my tones are wrong, but he said, "When I die, when he's talking about himself, I'm going to be not worrying about anything. I'm going to be chai 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 chai." How even you, even even. So uh, I'm concerned. That's another. So he had compassion, but this is another quality of Ajahn Chah. His, he bestowed courage. He, he made you feel like you can do it. He didn't say, oh, that's so terrible about the pain. Just like when he held my hand, Jim, I did it hurt. He didn't say, oh, well, we got to do something. But he, we have to exterminate the centipedes. He didn't do that. But it's, it's important to know pain. And so he sort of made you, made me feel like, well, this is what you got to do. He wasn't coddling. 
No, no, but you certainly felt, uh, I mean, I certainly, it made such a difference. And then, uh, of course, then, you know, they couldn't figure out what it was. And then, you know, it was not long after that that I, I got typhoid. Yeah, I hadn't even got the typhoid yet. But then then they finally sent me back. And I wasn't well enough to go back to Bunkaloon, so they sent me to Bung Wai. Or Pasano was the... To Wat Nanachat. Wat Nanachat. It was Pasan, Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Babakaro. And, and then I started getting fever and delirious. And then when they were talking to Ajahn Chah and, and they were, I was still, you know, getting thinner because I'd had diarrhea for six weeks and then I'd, uh, six months, and then I'd had the centipede bite and then the urinating blood and then the delirious and then really hot fever. And so Ajahn Chah said we better, he had a disciple in Bangkok, so he said, well, let's, let's, uh, Let's send him to Bangkok. So uh, uh, they, um, Ajahn Pabakaro was going to take me on the train, overnight train. I was delirious, but if he, I came in and out of consciousness, but at the train station, I had Santa Gito, he's another one of the Western monks, was leaning over me saying, Kitty, you look terrible. <laughs> And uh, and he said, Ajahn Chah, sorry he can't be here, but he wants you to know he's he's looking after you, that he's thinking about you. So that was nice. And then, uh, so that was uh, that was in July, August, nineteen seventy-eight. So I got the typhoid just uh, a couple of years in. Wow! And so by this time, you've had. You have typhoid, you've been bitten by a centipede, not doing well. Just this morning we were talking about this and, and you mentioned that uh, Ajahn Chah maybe suggested a, a dietary change for you. The, well, no, the, the doctor, yeah. I guess what I didn't say is that thank goodness I'd had, a, I'd had some breakthroughs in my meditation mm -hmm. before I got really, really sick. In fact, um, probably a bit arrogantly again I think when I was at Bunkaluan I'd had this little breakthrough of seeing that that I could welcome all the thoughts I was afraid of that I, I could just good thoughts bad thoughts it was just thoughts and so that was that was really so I had this experience of the background the underlying ground of just the jitta that is, that's fine. That's, that's, I get this, this, uh, that's trustworthy. And I, I had this big upsurging of vows. Oh, I want to burn all my karma off. I want to do this, that, this, that. And then I had all these intentions of, you know, wanting to do wonderful things for, which is all not bad stuff, but, uh, and I sort of, sense that that blew a door open and then I even before the centipede bit me I was hearing them mm. I almost felt it coming for a while mm. so anyway then when I did get really sick the doctor and the surgeon and the, uh, the head doctor in Bangkok said this monk's going to die if, if he gets diarrhea again he's got to eat minimum six times a day mm. minimum tiny amounts and so that's when Ajahn Chah made the joke mm. but but he he made a joke about it but he 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 didn't forbid it he let me know okay so when I came back and they explained to him that I was eating six times a day Ajahn Chah said all right for a while you can be a pig <laughs> <laughs> he says you can be a pig for a while and then after that you can be a human and then when the time comes you can be a big cook again you can be a monk <laughs> again so he was uh he was he 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 kept he had the ability to, with me at least, to help me not take it so seriously. He helped me. I might my I worry a lot and I catastrophize and and get all caught up. He helped me, uh, but but still see that it was going to be fine, mm -hmm. you know. But that, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, it sounds like a a pretty distinct shift 
of meditative focus, you know, over the time before you came to Thailand, you know, you were doing this Burmese, perhaps mm. very focused, right, right, right. Uh, very focused type of meditation. And then two or three years into it, you're doing, you know, you mentioned this teaching of Puru being the, the yeah, one who knows. Yeah. Are there other teachings of his that you either picked up explicitly from him or just... Well, you know, his... Ploy Wong is yeah, huge. You know, just, just let go, let go, let go. But I guess what I didn't mention is also right before I got the typhoid, so I, I was, you know, still not well, but I hadn't... So I'd been bitten by the centipede. I'd come out of urinated blood in the hospital experience right before I got the big fever, but I just was really depressed. I, um, I, uh, I, you know, just was so aware of the afflictions in my mind, lust, you know, mm -hmm. there was, I remember we were doing water one day and a long, young Laotian girl was there. We shared a well with the villagers and, she uh, uh, and when she saw us coming, you know, she was being respectful of so she she went off uh, away. But then, you know, after we were finishing leaving, and and she said, "Lalabo," something like, "Are you finished yet?" Hmm. But somehow, the way you know, she just said that. I mean, you know, how the mind just latches on to stuff, and it's, it's, it's you know, um, my mind just you know, you know, I just. You know, sexual desire was a was a big thing, and then the eating. I would vow every day to be mindful of eating, and I would always sort of wake up when my bowl was empty, and I felt like a beached whale, mm. and I just had all this self hatred and self judgment and and greed and and lust and the all night sittings once a week. You know, you want to be in samadhi, and it, you know, it wasn't. So I felt I started getting really depressed, and then you're sitting there, all these bald heads on the on the tamat all night sitting and you know you know how it is you're supposed to sit on eye but then you know after a while people are nodding and and then I and then you know I can look and see other people nodding but then part way during the night then someone I remember a Thai monk one day I nodded off and then he excuse me Ajahn he punched me like that and he said Samadhi D my <laughs> is, is your is your concentration good? <laughs> and you know, I could I could feel like pushing him over. So I I felt really depressed, and I and at that time, Pabakara Ajahn Pabakara was the abbot, and I said, "Golly, I feel really depressed. Do you think you can arrange to help me talk to Ajahn Chah?" And uh, he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, sure." So he went over when everybody else was at the evening chanting. He arranged so that Ajahn Pabakara translating took me to. Talked to Ajahn Chah under his hut. And, you know, he, you know, he goes, Bin Young, you know, well, what How is it? Doing? What's and, going on? And I said, Well, I feel like I'll, I'll never laugh again. Mm -hmm. I said, I just feel really depressed. It all seems too much, all this lust. And, and then he said, Oh, well, tell me something about your previous life. So I told him about being a wrestler and all the things that I used to do. And he said, um, Hmm. He said, you know, you remind me of a chipmunk. <laughs> and it was some word for like Girl squirrel, around. chipmunk, but it was one that could could fly a bit. It was mm -hmm. like a so he said this baby like a baby chipmunk saw its mother go up trees and jump to this branch and this branch and then the baby said, I want to do that. So it went up and jumped and then this word is dog. It Don't fell. Get. Dog, it fell down and started crying. This baby chipmunk and the mo mother said, you need to go to school. And so this chipmunk, uh, or whatever it was, went to kindergarten and went to school and then it learned a few moves and you can jump on this branch, this branch, but then dog, you know, <laughs> thud. And, and when he would do that, so he was... Ajahn Prabhakar was whispering the translation in my ear, and Ajahn Chah was sitting in his wicker chair looking down. And almost like when it fell down, it was almost like his eyes would go in a circle. But uh, anyway, so he had this, this chipmunk going to high school and then you know, college. And 
and it kept falling down and, and the mother kept saying, go to school. But, you know, somewhere in there was getting a degree, higher degrees. And, and, and at some point I just, I started laughing and I started laughing so hard. He had this thing getting a PhD. I was rolling on the, <laughs> on the floor of his hut laughing so hard and, and Pabacro is still whispering in my ear what Ajahn Chah is saying and I had told him before I don't feel like I'll ever laugh again and um, finally I I was able to you know sit up and 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 uh, and you know he'd done all this training and Ajahn Chah looked me in the eye and said and you know in one day that chipmunk could do every single thing that its mother could do it could jump and this and that go over this branch that branch and it's like from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, I felt this bliss, this confidence, this, you know, you just keep doing the training, you keep doing the practice. And, and, it, and it was, so I was savoring that, that, that it's going to be okay. It, 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 don't give up. It bestowing courage. And then he said, but you know, you also remind me of a donkey. <laughs> And I, I was, wait a minute, I'm still savoring the chipmunk. And so he went on, so, you know, Pavarka said, he says, you also remind him of a donkey. And so I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and so, um, and this, I think, has taken me years. And, I'm, and I think Tanisha, my wife Tanisha, I think is helping me more with this one to really comprehend what it means. But the donkey story, which I kind of blotted out for a while, for years. The don Ajahn Chah said, this was a very industrious and clever donkey. This donkey listened to the music that the ch cicadas, the insects in the mm -hmm. forest were making, and it thought, let me do some research, because I want to do that. And it saw, you know, this is, we're talking effort venerable. <laughs> so it saw that these cicadas ate little dew drops. And so I said, ah, the mystery. So it, it very diligently in the morning licked hundreds and thousands of dewdrops and then prepared to make music. Ajahn Chah's telling. And it opened its mouth and was so disappointed. <laughs> and then his story ended. <laughs> So I just, and, um, you know, I love the one about you just do the practices and this and that, and, you know, then you'll, it's in your nature. You notice all these stories of the dog, and these are all animals. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, now that I think about it, and I'm still understanding, but I think it's something about this donkey was trying to be what it wasn't. And, you know, it, it had effort, but it was, you know, wrong view. And there's something about letting what we grow into come out of our body, our mind. You know, learning to find one's own sound or appreciate one's own sound, to purify one's own sound. I think it's something about looking at, uh, for me over the years, Allowing our dreams to be rooted in how it is. He's not saying not to dream, not to aspire, but also learning to look at this aversion to self. I have a lot of, and I think it's also endemic in our society. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was, that was, uh, so as a teaching, I think, you know, the training, the practice, not giving up, but then I think there's something about Really making peace with this with this form, with this sound, not not just trying to ignore one's own tendencies, one's own sound. You know, like you know, he also like he, one thing he famously said was, uh, you know, don't be in a hurry to get rid of your affliction. You know, they're your teachers. You know, we we work with what we are, and that that's what flowers and grows into into, you know, affliction turns into, into Bodhi, into awakening. So I think it's something like that, but you might have more insight into that. No, that's fascinating. I hadn't, yeah, it's, it's so interesting just hearing different stories about Ajahn Chah from different people and you just get 
variations on this this theme of you know compassion and very unique stories i hadn't heard of course any of what we had talked about one or two of them this morning mm. but uh Aside from that, they're all very unique. I mean, not long after you got sick, you headed back to England, but are there any, we're getting close to time, but would love uh, if you had any more stories to relate about your interactions with them. Ah, okay. Yeah. I think more in England. You know, then... Were you in England when he came yes, to visit? Yes, I, I was in oh, England. For both? Yeah, yeah. Both the visits. Oh, wow. Well, the first one before I came to England was when he, I guess... No, I was there. I was there when he, he came to Hampstead and there when he came to Chithurst. No, I was there for both visits. I, I guess... Um, One was an interesting, I mean, to me, even after he got really sick, I can't, one story I love him, I mean, this, you won't think it's profound, but he was just so honestly talking about his sickness. Hmm. You know, there's a phrase in Thai, when you do exercise, ok gam lang. Ok gam lang, Kai. Yeah. But then he was, he turned it around and said, come on all. Come on all. <laughs> just, Your energy he was, is going he, out. He was talking about how his energy <laughs> and his eyes are, sta, see, dong, see, you know, all the spoiling of his. And, um, and he, um, and it was just really, he needed to rest. And there, there was just something, I mean, we might, this might sound strange, but when he needed to, to lie down and rest in this little hut, there were just a few monks with him. To lie down and rest in the same hut, just a few feet from Ajahn Chah, there was, there was this sense of, uh, oh, there was such safety around him. There was this deep sense of everything is well. Everything is well. So people may have missed it, but for me that was really significant. I'd heard a bit about this before, but so he... You were still somewhat sick and needing to lie down on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, but but you know there was a few monks here, so I mean we took a little rest in together this in little the same hut room. in the same little room, and it wow. which was uh, and he was you know make talking about you know the eyes are no good, the stomach's no good, and instead of in you know that my energy is all all gone out, and uh, yeah, and and I. I had a dream that then he got paralyzed eventually and um, he, what felt real to me is when he came to me in the dream and this time I, so even though I got over the typhoid there was a period of a decade I was still quite sick and then three years, at least you know, three years where I almost had to lie down all the time at Chithurst. I just, I, they had a little room for me just to to rest a lot, I just, the damage, I guess, from the typhoid or whatever. And, um, and anyway, in the dream, Ajahn Chah was going around, the, the different monks were on the, sitting on the platform, but, you know, I was lying down, and he had this honey, and he was giving some honey to each of the monks, and I was feeling ashamed, oh God, I'm lying down, I gotta try to make myself get up. And he came to me and says, you don't need to get up. <laughs> He said, all you need to do, and then he he reached in to my throat in the dream, to this very uncomfortable place in the throat. He says, you just need to contemplate the sense of self. Hmm. You just need to contemplate the sense of self. And, um, and he said, you know, you have a, and then I was asking about his illness, and he said, "I'm not going to get that, something like that." But he says, "You're you're in the dream, at least." He says, "Yours is an intellectual disease. You're going to get better." Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then in the dream, I 
didn't just wake up, but I was aware of a dream, and then the dream world <laughs> exploded, and so then there was no body, and there was hurtling through space really at incredible speed with millions of little dots of light, and then coming back into the body. <sighs> it was, it was, uh, but it was a sense of... Uh, uh, and, and, and the vision of two little twins, two little children playing. I was curious. But, um, and I was able to, before I disrobed, I was able to, I felt I didn't want to just disrobe, I wanted to pay my respects to Ajahn Chah. Mm. And a, a Thai supporter, the monastery, who owned Thai restaurants, and I'd helped some in, with over the years with her life and practice and she's offered to she said it's good to see your teacher and, and she, i said you know but it looks like i'll probably disrobe and she said that's all right but it's just good to see your teacher first so that you can really lay that out and at that time Ajahn Chah wasn't talking but uh i i went and I had the chance to help with the nursing of him for a few days, and I slept on the little sidewalk of his the, the hut where he was. And in my heart, I just uh, wanted to, you know, let him go about my intention to disrobe, and um, just you know, laying it out there, you know, wanting to welcome whatever came into my mind. He wasn't speaking, but uh, he. Um, in my heart, I felt uh, his blessing. So mm -hmm. there's other stories, but uh, you know, I just feel so grateful to to encounter, have encountered Ajahn Chah, Rumpa Chah, and Ajahn Sumedho, who could translate in this community of of monks, and then monks, monks and nuns, and then lay people who are so supportive. But it, it has been a real treasure in me, those few interactions I've had, they really continue to guide and inspire me, you know, to me, you know, one of the main ones is that you can do it, I really yeah. felt that he, you know, he would say the Buddha wouldn't have taught this if it was impossible. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Desara, thank you so much, and uh, definitely will try to have another interview with you at some point. Um, this was fabulous with uh, talking about Ajahn Chah, and uh, I think people will really enjoy it. So thank you, and thank you, everyone, for thank you. tuning in and watching, and uh, wish everyone a good evening, and hopefully talk later. Thank you for yeah. this opportunity, yeah. Ajahn. Night, everybody. <laughs>